So we first get our first look at Max Rebo and his band and the return of the Jedi. So why don't we just go around the horn here a little bit and talk about our first experiences with Return of the Jedi. Uh, Hooney, let's start with you. Uh, getting into Return of the Jedi, you know, do you have a, a memory of watching this, you know, for for a first time or uh, like a memory as like a kid watching it or where you watched it? Um, yeah, so I think I might have mentioned it on our last podcast. Um, films were a way to really lock me in place with concrete shoes for a solid, you know, two and a half hours because I was a very active and imaginative kid and I would run around all of, all over the place outside. So my dad really loved the idea of like, okay, so he likes movies. Let's put a movie in front of him and we'll know exactly where he is for a few hours. So uh, Return of the Jedi was uh, the end of a, I think we watched A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back, back to back. And then I think we went to get lunch or something and came back and we watched Return of the Jedi. And yeah, that, that was the, uh, the firing shot where I had my uh, obsession born, I guess. It was created, it was crafted perfectly in that afternoon. And um, yeah, I, I took to in my fourth, fifth, tenth, twentieth rewatch <laughs> of the movies, having them on in the background, falling mm-hmm. asleep to them, or like drawing or making little clay figures that I used to make as a kid because they figured it was more cost effective rather than buying, buying a $10 figure, $15, mm-hmm. $20 figure, just $10 of clay and he'll make his own toys. So I'd spend a lot of hours watching the movies and just making these little figures to like have them fight the next day. So I paid attention a lot like to just like the background characters because there's such a breadth of detail in the background shots of all of the movies. Mm-hmm. It's the used universe uh, thing that Lucas and them wanted to wanted to make, and it's uh, uh, it just makes for a, like a visual feast every time whenever you just like peel off of the main characters for a little while so yeah max was definitely one of them that caught my eye whenever i was younger and it was just so goofy little did i know the goofiest to come would probably be the the giant rat in the holiday special or (laughs) you know the uh the giant ant that just showed up in uh the mandalorian but those Mm -hmm. side characters it's always great just seeing random crazy things and somehow they work like i felt so sad for frog lady whenever uh her eggs are getting taken out by yeah (laughs) but yeah yeah, it's it's crazy you you care for these little characters and oh it's a good time so yeah Yeah. i guess that's my spiel um yeah good spiel yeah that's true i um you know even to this day you know having watched these films now you know for uh you know the majority of my life you'll still see you know in the cantina at jabba's palace um, you know, running around on Hoth, like I'll be listening to a podcast or reading a book or something. And someone will make mention of a character that's in the scene. I'm like, oh, I never noticed that before. And you go back and you're like, man, there's so much stuff going on in all of these. So, uh, yeah, that's definitely, definitely very cool. Uh, Cassia return of the Jedi. Uh, tell us about it. When, when did you see it the first time? Do you remember it or did it stick out or do you have any kind of vivid memories of watching return of the Jedi? Um, I might've borrowed it from my aunt and uncle. Um, because the first time I saw Star Wars was when I was like, my parents were out of town. I was being babysat and I was like, Ooh, cool. Star Wars exists. And I didn't realize it was a trilogy. I just thought it was Star Wars, you know, a new Mm -hmm. hope or whatever. And then, so I just would watch that over and over again. And then people would be like, there's a five and a six. And it was like, Oh, cool. Five and six. And then it's like, wait, is there a one, two, three? And they're like, they don't exist yet. And I'm like, okay. Like, I'm a kid, so some wise person probably made that decision. Um, But, like, I would just borrow them so much. And, like, I love, like, Star Wars. That So for um, Christmas one year, um, I was gifted the golden special edition uh, VHS tapes for uh, the original trilogy. And I just loved it. And... I loved watching all of them, but like Return of the Jedi, like I think it has a little bit of everything. It has desert, uh, musical numbers, Han and Leia kissing, uh, Ewoks, 
redemption and we can't forget the lightsabers and I just loved watching it as a kid and mm -hmm. um, something about George Lucas that I, I think is smart is that every background character kind of can have a name and a story and that makes it like good for like merch opportunities you know um, like everyone potentially could have an action figure and I, I knew like I just like as a kid like somehow like kind of knew like some of the names uh, of all the characters like like they're in the guidebooks like that's that's the fun thing is like all right, of these yeah. things are like I think it'll be like even if you look in an old like thing about Return of the Jedi or the original trilogy it can be like it points at Max Rebo's fingers and I think it's like his dexterous fingers like his suction allows for like good uh touching the keys or whatever like mm -hmm. the wording was probably off but like probably <laughs> close enough you know but right yeah yeah and yeah i always thought it, uh the max rebo species ortolans were, were so cute and i remember in one of the is it Tartarovsky Clone Wars season three, like in the beginning where they're kind of oh, like, right. there's an orderly orderlin family. And I'm like, Oh, that could have been yeah. Max Rebo. And like, yeah. he's maybe a prisoner of war. I don't know. And <laughs> he's just so cute. And then I think like yeah. I fell into the major Max Rebo fandom by, by following your account, Hooney. And I'm like, uh, I understand <laughs> this. Like, we need not just an into the spider verse, but like a Max oh, yeah. Rebo verse. And yep. I think there is potential there. Yeah, absolutely. There is. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so for me, going back to return of the Jedi. So um, I probably would have started watching the star Wars films when I was like four ish years old, at least uh, watching them, you know, with any sort of like conscience about it. Um, my brother is seven years older than me. So he was like prime, original trilogy age so i'm just i'm just a little bit on the young side to have caught it on the first pass through so um it was like a it was like a frequent like movie rental now a new hope's always been my favorite of the star wars films uh but especially like as a little kid the return of the jedi is just so awesome there's all the creatures um there's the ewoks you know all the stuff that cassie just said there's a little bit of everything in there um it's exciting mm. the pacing is pretty quick uh so it's you know it's good in that sense for kids um but yeah, I remember, you know, watching it, you know, kind of that uh, theatrical cut just on uh, video. My mom worked just down the street from like our big like county uh, library. So she would swing by, uh, you know, a couple of nights a week and pick up movies. And I was always hopeful that it was going to be, you know, at least one of the Star Wars films. And uh, yeah, definitely fell in love with Return of the Jedi and, and all of the action. And yeah, seeing Max Rebo wailing uh, back there was definitely a uh, really great part. Oh yeah, for for sure. You gotta love those uh, oh, those those movie rentals. Uh, I really miss our local blockbuster. It's like a cycle studio now, but uh, yeah, I still drive by and look fondly. Uh, yeah, I think I think I had the same VHS, VHS uh, set that you had, uh, Cassia. Um, I just know that I had to be very very careful with it. It was my dad's. It was a very beautiful case, and it had, you know, the very uh, gleaming. It's Vader on the front, right? It's like, yeah. You'd get the uh, you'd get the gold was the uh, full screen. It was half of the helmet, mm -hmm. and then the other was the silver for the oh. like the widescreen version. And you could put them put them together and get like yep. the full helmet. Yeah, gold. Yep, was better, that was it. So. Gold, gold was better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, that's true. Gold. That's why. That's why you win a gold medal at the Olympics. Yeah, I guess. you mm -hmm. don't win a silver. Well, I can't. I guess you can, but like gold you know is, is better so <laughs> honestly the behind the scenes in that too and the um the dvds and the uh i can't i don't think they had it for the vhs but i was pretty young so mm -hmm. um a lot of that was amazing to watch as well yeah i think that was like one of the first uh kind of behind the scenes uh looks into into film films that i was aware of and mm -hmm. I think that I think the Lord of the Rings like DVDs yep. kind of popularized that um, practice because I remember like getting a back in the day I'm gonna complain like getting a DVD <laughs> was amazing because you got the commentary mm -hmm. you got all these bonus features like 
Oh yeah. It was mm-hmm. it was an event. Like your your weekend was planned if you got the Harry Potter, you know, Sorcerer's Stone on DVD and you could you could watch that and like there was so much like extra content that you didn't have to pay for, you know? And oh, yeah. but nowadays it's just like you have a DVD and like here's some commercials, we don't <laughs> care. Like Yep. Yep. Uh, here's the extra features. It's a trailer for the thing you just watched. Yeah. So that's that's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, and you could spend a whole day just like watching how they made the movie and all the masks and the sets and everything, and uh, that was great as well for the um, Star Wars DVDs because you could see how they made like a lot of the background characters, a little bit yeah. more about Boba mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And yeah, I, I I remember vividly like realizing that Jabba was not this big slug creature, but like four dudes in a suit that were probably you know on the verge of heat exhaustion. Yeah. Like every second of their performance. One guy actually, so. uh, Carrie Fisher, had these really high heels on, you know, and like was stepping over Jabba. He, he actually got stepped on like, oh, through no. Jabba. And I'm like, oh, oh my man. God. Like, man, like, wow, you know, but that, that happened. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I would hate to be on the Java team, and it's like cool. Like, yeah. how about I like perfect him outside, and you guys stand, <laughs> and squat around in the super hot slug thing. <laughs> yeah, things are always yeah. dangerous at Java's Palace, for sure. Yeah, for sure. All right, so. The Return of the Jedi, uh, it gets open in space, but then we're going to cut down to Tatooine. We see C-3PO, R2-D2, walking through the desert. Uh, very similar to, you know, getting a new hope started off. Uh, but this time, they have a destination in mind, and it's Jabba's Palace. You see it in the background. They're walking up to it. And we get this amazing kind of opening sequence. At Jabba's Palace, we meet Bib Fortuna. We meet Gamorrean guards. We meet Jabba himself. We see the bounty on the wall, Han Solo and Carbonite, and we get the uh, the first glimpse at the little blue musician and his band, Max Rebo. Uh, so the opening sequence of Return of the Jedi, it's awesome. Everyone knows it's awesome. Uh, but Huni, what are your favorite parts of, of kind of that first section, uh, getting to Jabba's palace, you know, before before we head out into the desert? This is the Max Rebo podcast and uh, episode sorry and we are talking about a musician but i want to talk about john williams's score in that introduction scene Mm -hmm. it is so so very strong the way that it swells and it dips and you just feel like kind of um you feel anxious now that i'm thinking about it i might be thinking of whenever leia is going to save han um but yeah, I should have done a rewatch before this episode. I apologize. Um, but yeah, uh, that original cut, it's it's so great, like I was saying before, seeing all the characters in the background and uh, those original costumes in that as they're hamshackled together. Some of them even just, you know, you, you can kind of tell that they're a bit loose in places. They don't fully fit. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's it's great, even in its um, its first state. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Cassio, what about you? Um, we're getting to Jabba's Palace. Are there, are there any, you know, kind of things that are going on at Jabba's Palace or any of the characters that we're reintroduced to? Um, I guess you have to go back in the mindset, like to 1983. So you're seeing all of these beloved characters again. You've had a, a three-year absence from them. But what were your favorite parts of the Jabba's Palace? Well, in 1983, I didn't exist, but... Um... <laughs> You have to pretend this is a a thinking exercise. Okay. Like, I was like, well, actually, I didn't watch it in 1983, but, like, as a child, kind of watching it, like, and watching it later, like, I think this might be the closest that Star Wars gets to maybe, like, a a Bond opening. Like, you kind of start That's exactly what I think. Yeah. Like, so it's like you're kind of undercover, you know? Like, if you really think about it, like, I don't know what the plan was. They just all kind of show up at different times. Like, if Return of the Jedi was released today, people would be like, ooh, there's a plot holding, you know, like, uh, like, but it's a Bond opening, and then, like, it has an action scene where you, like, see 
Luke reveal his green lightsaber and the team's reunited and they're awesome. And then like if it were a Bond movie, that's when you would get a song like Return of the Jedi or something. And <laughs> By Billie Eilish. <laughs> or, or who was big in 1983? Who would you guys want to do the hypothetical Star Wars Bond opening number for Return Let's of the see. Jedi? Let's see. That probably would have been about the time that uh, Wings. When did uh, Live and Let Die? So maybe uh, maybe Paul McCartney could have could have done the uh, mm-hmm. the Star Wars James Bond uh, mashup. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe for me, David Bowie. But like, oh no, no, that would be that would be good. That'd be or good. they could have scooped up. Uh, was it Pink Floyd who was uh, gonna do Yorkie's oh Dune? Like either of those, <laughs> mm-hmm. I would have been fine with. So. That would have been fantastic. They'd have to have the score for the whole movie, though, right? They'd have to overlay it. <laughs> That's Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that intro sequence, I think it's really great that we get to see um, the puppets in that up so close and mm-hmm. get to see, like, all the detail on them. And, you know, before CGI, it was all craftsmanship. It was all handmade stuff, handmade materials, and uh, people in suits, as we were talking about with uh, Jabba. And I don't know, there's so much charm in having that, like, real, you know, um, tangible materials to look at. It just, I don't know, there's so much magic in it. Even, like, pre-CGI stop motion, there's some instances where it's rougher or it doesn't really matter. It just, there's still so much magic to it. And, um, yeah, I really, really appreciate that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, yeah, so there's a lot of cool stuff going on at Jabba's Palace. And, you know, basically by the time the our cast of characters gets there, uh, Leia gets there, you know, undercover as a bounty hunter with Chewbacca. Uh, she rescues Han and, you know, Jabba gets the drop on her doing that. Um, that's that's kind of when we get our first real good look at, at uh, Max Rebo and his band there uh, doing their performance, uh, doing some dancing. Everyone's uh, having a good time. Now, in the original, um, you know, it's pretty subdued. You got the, you know, John Williams, the Max Rebo score uh, going on there. And then in the special editions that came out, uh, you have the whole, like, full-blown, what it's called, like, Jedi Rocks, I think, is the name of the, the song <laughs> yeah, that Jedi they're performing. Rocks. Um, yeah. So uh, I don't, I don't know. I'm I'm a fair bit older than than both of you. So uh, do you have like memories of the the pre special editions um, or versus the you know versus the special editions? Do you have one you you prefer? Do you like the like the uh, edition of Jedi Rocks? Uh, let's go over to you, Huni. Uh, which which uh, version here is better for Max? Do you think? So the special edition versus the original. When I was younger, I did watch these movies so many times, and I think I had a res uncle, that's somebody that's not your actual family, but is your uncle, that had the original release VHS of all the movies. So I got babysat over there a lot as well. Um, We'd run around outside with sticks and, you know, pretend we were, you know, Jedi and come in with our knuckles all uh, (laughs) in different states from those fights, but... uh, we would also come in whenever it got dark and then watch movies. It was, uh, it was a really great time. And I, I watched Return of the Jedi, Empire Strikes Back, and all of them a lot over there. And then I came home and I watched the special edition. Mm-hmm. And I feel like Jedi Rocks was the first instance whenever I was young where I was like, mm, this is different. I'm going to fast <laughs> forward. That okay. I don't like this. This is too much for me. Like, I did enjoy it because of, you know, uh, some of the goofier stuff. But whenever, uh, m- good good sir, Mr. Mr. Yowza gets mm-hmm. right up into the camera and we can see his molars and how much he flosses or doesn't floss. Uh, <laughs> I was like, ah, that's that's a bit too much. Like, I remember like, he that. He spits on the screen as well, right? He spits right on the camera. He does, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, eh, no, not for me. Um, but yeah, uh, that's how I felt on that. So Cassio, what about, what about you? Special edition, uh, Jedi rocks versus, you know, the, the original, just kind of the, the background, you know, Max is just doing his thing. Uh, yeah, Jabba, Jabba's doing his thing in the background. Which, which one do you prefer? Do you have a, do you have good memories of, of seeing the, the new cut or is that the one you basically grew up on or? 
it's the one I grew up on, so I didn't even know it was like a, a change. And I thought it was fun because like it was music. And I do remember mm-hmm. the guy when he would like he would like go. He was kind of like screaming into the screen, like the, the where he did have like uh, <laughs> teeth, and you could see them, and there was spit. Like uh-huh. apparently that was a deal breaker for many fans, but it's what I grew up <laughs> with. So I kind of prefer the the newer songs. So okay. I'm just one of those blind blind fans that just likes something because I grew up with it, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. So we so we have Hooney over there. He's uh he he's uh you know putting the putting the kibosh on the new one. Uh, Cassie is uh, Cassie is all in on it. Um. So I remember when the special editions came out, there were there were like one big scene from each of the films, basically that got everyone in a tizzy and divided everyone. Mm-hmm. Right. So you had Jabba in A New Hope. You had uh, the Wampa in. Uh, the Empire Strikes Back, and then you had this, the edition of uh, Jedi Rocks. Um, I kind of like Hooney the first time I saw it. I'm like, this this seems out of place and mm-hmm. unnecessary. Um, I never I never really hated it, per se, but I, I was like, oh, eh, oh, okay. I guess have, have your fun, Mr. Lucas. That's fine. Um, yeah, do what you want. But now that that's that's the version that you watch if you ever are going to, yeah. you know, throw in Return of the Jedi. That's that's what you see. Um, so now at this point, it's just kind of like ingrained that that's that's what you're going to see. So it, it seems like it fits better, um, and I like it. I like that uh, Max and the band gets a chance to really kind of jam out, uh, which is good. Puts a little bit more focus on them, which is always good. I think. Um, yeah. So so I'm loving the Jedi Rocks, but Jedi Rocks gets cut a little bit short. Because uh, Ula, uh, one of the dancers there at Jabba's palace, you know, she, uh, you know, confronts Jabba. Jabba doesn't like that because Jabba, not the nicest of guy, drops her down into the Rancor pit. And, and we get the, uh, get the glimpse of the Rancor there. Uh, any, thoughts on, any thoughts on the Rancor? My, uh, personally, as a kid, I, I loved the Rancor. I thought he was awesome. I thought he looked super cool. Um, he's like the stop motion puppet kind of thing. Um, uh, really loved him. Uh, what about you, Huni? Rancor? Fan? Oh, Oh yeah, uh, nothing but love for the Rancor. And watching the behind the scenes stuff and how it's like animated, um, I I don't remember what age I was whenever I, you know, saw that behind the scenes portion. But it really um, blew my mind that it was such a small figure in comparison to um, how I had imagined the Rancor to look and feel and the the tremor in the ground that he would probably produce as he comes towards Ula. It's Mm-hmm. You know, not the greatest fate for her. I mean, she really didn't deserve any of that. And from what we know on the lore about the lives that Twi'leks are, um, you know, leading, especially around that time, not mm-hmm. the best. But the Rancor, amazing. Uh, all the tiny little details and the teeth that aren't like all the way straight, that aren't coming in uh, perfectly. Um, just like the scarring on him, the the carapace that's around his back. Mm-hmm. Amazing. So, so good. And we can talk about it later on, but whenever he crunches down on the Gamorrean and just that, that crunch that you hear in the squeal, like I felt that. And mm-hmm. yeah, it, so, so good. Huge, huge fan over here. Yeah, super, uh, super like visceral feeling and sounding like yeah. even as a kid, like I remember that. Uh, like you said, it has like, like the teeth and it has like the, like kind of like, like, mucus and saliva and stuff yeah. coming out of it is uh, super gross. as it goes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. uh just just loved it the way that it looked uh what about you cassia uh rancor fan are you a bigger fan of uh mookie from from the uh the bad batch <laughs> the, the little baby rancor or? Mm-hmm. uh i i'm not opposed to mookie the baby rancor which <laughs> now as i say that out loud it should be a children's cartoon but um mm-hmm. i don't know like i Rancor, 10 for 10. Ula, that's a great scene. Um, and I believe they filmed some additional scenes uh, when they were doing the special editions. So that's the same actress kind of uh, in different decades. So gotcha. that's really cool. And mm-hmm. just everything about that, it, it raises the stakes. And then Luke has to, has to beat it, you know. And Rancors have been in... Uh, video games like the force unleashed and <laughs> yeah. uh kotor and i that yeah. stupid rancor in the teresian undercity <laughs> hated it so much 
so yeah, that's right. much. <laughs> he lives lives down in the sewers, and you have to get past him. It's the worst. Yeah, um, I remember viscerally my stomach dropping and feeling real fear whenever I opened that door after opening a thousand doors that looked exactly the same and turning <laughs> left and seeing a pile of bones and viscera and looking beyond in my head i feel like i remember just being like oh huh, something new and then looked further down the corridor and just saw the back of the rancor and my stomach just oh man <laughs> and um i i think i had a a prima a prima guide book that yeah. mm-hmm. I was like using here and there, here and there. I was young, here and there. I would use it, and my my uncle had told me how to do it. And oh yeah, you go out to the rain huh? and I'm like, yep, yep, uh, terrified. And uh, he tossed me the book, and I figured out how to take him out. But I did try and fail so many times, and died so many times to the rain um, Yeah. So good, so terrifying, and yeah, my stomach really just just fell into the ground. <laughs> All right, and if we are going to get out to the Sarlacc, what better way to do it than on Jabba's sail barge? So Luke showed up. Uh, Han is out of the Carbonite. He is recovering from, uh, was it, uh, car- uh, hibernation sickness. Uh, so he can't really yep. see what's going on. He knows that he's in the desert. It's bright. It is hot. It's sandy. Uh, but he doesn't know the fate that he's about to meet. So the Jabba's sail barge sequence is awesome. Uh, R2-D2 has a lightsaber because R2-D2 is the hero. Uh, he's a Jedi, Jedi droid, I think, pretty sure. Um, but Jabba's sail barge, a lot is happening in this little short sequence and our heroes, you know, come out on top, uh, you know, to get all of the, all of the members of the party back together. Uh, but Huni, tell us about Jabba's sail barge. What are, what are some highlights, uh, from this, uh, pleasure cruise turned gone amok, I guess. I feel like all the, um, what are they called again? Oh, no, I'm blanking. Fake fan over here. Um, <laughs> the guys with the real rugged acorn faces. The weak way. Yeah, the, the weak way. Yeah. The weak way were a great uh, addition. Because I remember seeing those and just like, ooh, what happened to this man's skin? Like, really freaked me out. Mm-hmm. Um, again, to the note of background characters being amazing. Uh, all these villains that are just... You know, probably common thugs and, you know, assassins and whatever, they get so destroyed by Luke. Like, he, he can kick these men without even touching them. He's so skilled. And <laughs> yeah. it's it's so good, such a good sequence. And you really feel, you know, the, the adventure um, as Williams really pumps that score up with just pure flame. And the tension. I know that in Family Guy, they, you know parodied the sequence in their blue harvest special red harvest i'm probably misremembering mm-hmm. but they parodied that sequence and just held the tension for the longest time and i think that was during like the big star wars drought we had there for a while but yeah it's it's so good so so solid such a great time and yeah all the background characters and the detail and within the sail barge right there is um trophies that Jabba's taken I'm assuming from you know gangsters that owed him money or uh, people that did him wrong some type of way or stepped on his tail Uh, (laughs) Han is pretty lucky in that he didn't uh, end up on the wall or maybe he's he was destined to I mean he really was up on the wall for a while there just a different different type different type of trophy but yeah it's so good in all the details in the background and R2 uh, forced to drive all over the place and we know this man has taken out scores of droids, and I don't. I after rewatching it multiple times, I feel like R two is one of the most effective characters, and one of the most dangerous. After he destroyed those supers on um, Grievous's ship, mm-hmm. couldn't look at him the same. Couldn't look at him the same. That was that was the most creative way to defend himself. Oh yeah, and just straight out, you know. Just burn them with fire. Whatever. Burn them with fire. They're bigger than me. Burn them with fire. I don't care. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Cass- Cassia made the, the good observation about, uh, you know, this opening sequence being akin to like a Bond film, this big, huge set piece. Yeah. And R2-D2 is basically the best ever Bond gadget. So. Yeah. And he's yeah. serving drinks. He could have served a, a Vesper martini, you know? Yeah. That's and, right. Yeah. Yeah. And 
shaken, not stirred, you know? But yeah, for sure. Shaken, not stirred. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, what uh, what about you, Cassia? The the sail barge. There's a lot going on. Uh, one of your favorite characters is there, a notorious bounty hunter. Uh, he meets a an untimely fate, though. But do you have any favorite parts of the the sail barge sequence? I don't know. It's just uh, it's unique because it's kind of like a tent tent boat, mm-hmm. you know, and it's floating, and that's always fun to to see in Star Wars, like anti gravity stuff. Mm-hmm. And I just thought it was hilarious that uh, R2 had to uh, serve drinks. And maybe as a young woman, maybe I should have questioned, why is Princess Leia in a gold bikini and chained to, you know, like a slug? And is this going to impact, like, <laughs> I don't know, like my views of women's role in society. But I didn't because I was a kid. And that's the yeah. that's the culture I grew up in you know but um yeah like it was just cool to see like Jedi like uh to see Luke just kind of like you're like he's not gonna die something interesting is happening he's he's being awesome and kind of telling Jabba he's gonna die and then he he signals to R2 and then it's like lightsaber time and who cares about Boba Fett Mm -hmm. honestly he's overrated you know um but I hope (laughs) if he ever survives you know, somehow he leaves with his eyebrows intact so he can convey emotion, you know? Well, that's right. That's right. And there's a book about it. <laughs> yeah. a book. Yeah. About I'm it. leaving that book at the library. I'm, I'm picking up the Max Rebo show. I don't know about you uh-huh. guys. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So, so that's how I, I feel about Java's sail barge. Yeah. So Java's sail barge is, is pretty cool. So it's very much like a, um, like a pirate, like swashbuckling uh, kind of scene. You have Luke like walking the plank, like to the Sarlacc. The Sarlacc is really awesome. Uh, I thought it was a really, like even like as a little kid, I thought that that was like a really clever, like uh, kind of creature, like way to you know dispose of these people that had uh, wrong job. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I always kind of like that. Um, I I love um, you know that that Leia is like taking it to Jabba. Like she's the one that that takes them out, and they end up blowing up the. The ship, that's pretty awesome. Uh, Boba Fett does, uh, yeah, he meets an untimely uh, end, we think, for, you know, for the time, at least back then in there, which, you know, a little ham-fisted for somebody who supposedly is pretty awesome. Um, I always really liked the the bit with uh, Han and Lando. Lando's down, he's like got his leg, or got a tendril wrapped around his leg, and, and Han's like, it's, mm-hmm. it's okay, I can see a lot better now. I always really like that part um, as a kid, too. But The way Lando kind of like yelps, it's like, it's hard to... Yeah. It's like, yeah! I was like, was that <laughs> yeah. the Sarlacc, or was that Lando? Like, That's right. It's such an honest response, right? Like, yeah. yeah it, you exactly. freak right out. Exactly, yeah, for sure. He's the um, smoothest guy in the galaxy, but he really just... You know, let his emotions ride in that moment of like, oh no, <laughs> like mm-hmm. really freaked out. Like this is a man on the edge of falling into, you know, just digestion for thousands of years, and he doesn't care. He's literally on an uphill climb and seeing the end, and suddenly a tentacle grabs him. I I, I don't put it past him to yelp a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I would have I would have been uh, yelping. For sure. And I think in that behind the scenes kind of documentary stuff we get from this, you see like the underneath of the Sarlacc where like the the stunt um, actors are like falling down and and like having to like scramble out of the way because so many people are falling through it. And yeah, it's just it's just a super cool uh, sequence. And, you know, Max Rebo and the band, they're out there on on the uh, sail barge because, you know, Jabba needs tunes going while he's, you know, yeah. sacrificing his enemies to this beast in the desert. So, yeah. But we didn't see a body, and if Boba yeah. Fett can be alive after yeah. going into, you know, the stomach of a Sarlacc, I think Max Rebo survived because of rule of Droopy McCool, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's that's <laughs> right. If if it didn't happen on screen, uh, it could potentially have not happened. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that would be the the end for for max or not but it's a big explosion out in the desert uh boba fett is in the stomach of the sarlacc ready to digest until the year 2021 yeah i guess boba fett can be like the jonah of star wars you know he gets swallowed but then bat out 
I guess, or something. So. Yeah, for sure. I just really like Boba Fett, and I hope you guys know that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be eating my words and like, that's, that's right. When you when love Boba him so Fett much comes out and I'm going to be like, this is amazing guys. Like, yeah, he looks cool and he has a jet pack. So I, <laughs> I do love Tamara Morrison and, and everything. Oh, yeah. So I think I was just was surrounded by so many guys who were like, Boba Fett is so yep. awesome. And maybe that colored my perception. So I'm working on it. So that's right. All right. So Max Rebo, his little band, he brought us some hits. He toured the galaxy, you know, pursuing his passion. Um, he's a awesome, uh, probably the best character in all of Star Wars. Hooney, tell us about Max Rebo. Why is he awesome, and why, from 1983 until today, are we still talking about this guy? It's the swagger. It's the look. <laughs> it's the vibe. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> it is. It's everything about Max. He's he's both cute, he's smooth, he's blue. Sometimes he has four <laughs> limbs, sometimes he has two. You That's know, right. sometimes, you know, uh he's got a little diaper that he wears. I don't know. It he looks good in everything. He really really does. Um I have nothing but appreciation for this little blue elephant that we see kind of just doing a little jig. You know, there's murderers gangsters drug dealers there's dancers there's a hut there's a bounty hunter that's got you know uh, a wookie um thread just hanging off of them just to have that real visual piece of bragging rights and then there's max just sitting there clanging away making beautiful music with his little stubby hands and it's just amazing uh, there's there's no words to describe how great this little blue elephant man is um and I, I think we'll get close in this podcast but we'll never reach the magnificence that is max he is he is such a great little oh i, I just love him so much yeah <laughs> that's right yeah we can only we can only pay honor to max rebo here in this oh, podcast. Yeah. We, yeah. we can never we can never encapsulate what he uh brought to the world uh, for yeah. sure, with his with his gift of music, but Cassia, you mentioned you can that only kneel in deference. <laughs> <laughs> that that's right, absolutely. So yeah. Cassia, you'd said you got back on the Max Rebo train. Uh, you know, back following Hooney. Hooney is a huge Max Rebo fan, um, super fan. Uh, you know, first in line, been to been to all of his concerts. Uh, goes on tour. Oh yeah, uh, with him all the time. But what about what about you, Max Rebo? Was uh, was Max Rebo, something that stuck out to you, like remembering watching Return of the Jedi, or has it just been like over the years? You're like, man, this guy is, you know, he had he does have a lot of swagger and he is super cool. Yeah, like I think out of Jabba's Palace, like there's a lot of unique aliens, but I wouldn't call any of them cute except for Max Rebo. Like he kind of has that uh, cute and unique look that. Mm -hmm. um, I think watching that 2003, like, Clone Wars cartoon, I was like, his eyes are so expressive, you know? And I'm like, there is some potential here. And I would just love to see an Ortolan Jedi at some point. Like, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. It would be awesome. And uh, just... I I love the character and following Hooney. It just I was like, okay, I'm fully converted to to all things Max Rebo, and I think there is a quote I want to use, and it's like, if you define what Max Rebo is, the definition falls short. Max Rebo simply is. Max Rebo simply is. There you go. Very well put. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Max Rebo, yeah. It, he is awesome. So I did a very scientific um, survey on my Instagram page the other day um, just to see, you know, what people thought about Max Rebo, uh, you know, in a Battle of the Bands kind of situation up against the Cantina Band, Ooh. you know, probably the second best band in all of Star Wars. But the votes came in and 76% of the people who responded to my poll said Max Rebo was where it's at. Max Rebo is taking home the prize, yes. the gold record. Uh, and it's no surprise because Max Rebo is awesome uh, from his, yeah, his blue skin, his little beady eyes. Um, he's just there, like, hanging out, 
like Hooney said, there's all sorts of like scum and a villainy and crazy stuff happening. Leia pulls out a thermal detonator. Max is just there. He's like, I'm just, I'm just here to play my tunes. You know, just, just let mm-hmm. me be. Um, I'm bringing my art to the world, uh, to the galaxy, to Tatooine. And yeah, Max Rebo, he is awesome. So, in, in terms of Max Rebo, so we really got to learn about him, I guess. Well, we didn't. We were, we were all too young. But uh, Max Rebo was one of the you know, original uh, Kenner figures back when Return of the Jedi came out. So that would have been like the first Max Rebo merchandise that was out. Um, do either of you have uh, any Max Rebo merchandise or like T-shirts or you know, concert posters? Or if you don't have anything and you could have anything Max Rebo in the whole world, what would it be? Well, I don't have any Max Rebo merch, but I kind of think, like, there should be a Max Rebo sticker. It could even be a little bit, like, okay. a, kind of an understated one. Like, if you ever saw Tron Legacy, uh, mm-hmm. which, which mm-hmm. I've seen, like, you know, a couple times, uh, like, <laughs> if you look at, like, Sam Flynn's mm-hmm. helmet, like, there is an 89 uh, on his, uh, the back of his helmet that kind of also looks like a hidden Mickey. And it's also kind of like an abstract, uh, person on a, a light cycle. And I was like, huh, what if we could like have like a Max Rebo sticker like that? Cause like you could put it on like your, your musical instruments and just kind of sneak all things Max Rebo into everything. And mm-hmm. What if there was a cartoon or something, like, and it followed Max Rebo? It could even be, like, a little short one, and it's, like, into the Max Rebo-verse, you know? And (laughs) one pop quiz question I have for you. Who is your dream Max Rebo fan cast? Three, four paragraphs I have on merch. And (laughs) uh, (laughs) I'm not actually joking with that. Um, But, yeah, I, I feel like... The three that come to mind, early Max, okay? If we're if we're following the life of early okay. Max, I want to have, like, the vibe of The weekend. Uh, I've done a piece um, <laughs> that has Max in the, uh, the weekend Super Bowl uh, fit, and it did not do well. It kind of flopped, like, post-wise. Like, people were not showing up for the Max Rebo in the weekend fit. I don't know. I don't care. I love it. It it came out really good to me. It's probably due to the weekend and not due to Max Rebo. So, <laughs> oh, true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so for the next, I would say I want his voice to be like very white. Like I want him to be this tiny little blue man, but whenever he speaks, there's just this booming silk that comes out of him, and he's okay. forced to just sit and listen to whatever he has to say. Now, whenever we get into after he hits rock bottom and sees the pit of Carcoon, I want Max to have the vibe, gravitas, and energy of Danny DeVito. I really want him Mm. to be, you know, that down and out uh, person that is in the slums and in the the back alleys of uh, Tatooine after you know, surviving that explosion. And he just has the uh, the feel of, you know, Frank Reynolds from It's Always Sunny. Just Danny DeVito incarnate. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, uh, that's my that's my note on fan casts, that's, I suppose. That's, that's the fan cast. And, yeah. No, I absolutely love those. Uh, those those are really great. Um, yeah, I definitely, <laughs> definitely love the, uh, the Barry White, you know, the super... De- super oh, deep, yeah. uh, vocals that, that, that <laughs> that's just that's uh that's too good for sure and yeah i could see him you know being down on his luck being uh super paranoid because uh wouldn't you be if you were on a sail barge that just exploded in the middle of the desert you're from a you're from a frozen oh, yeah. planet and you're like ah the sun beating down on me what am i what am i going to do most icely is like you know ten thousand miles away or something so let's see yeah so i love those mm-hmm. of, I love those fan casts for sure. And I definitely can't top them. So I'm not even going to, going to try. So Cassia, <laughs> <I'm> so <sorry. laughs> who are your fan casts for Max Rebo? If, if you had to, uh, had to throw one or two out. Well, I only have one and I think this will make you happy. Hooney. Uh, it's Danny DeVito. Oh, oh very nice. Very yes. nice. People of substance. 
Yeah. And, <laughs> and actually, I I changed my I changed my tune. I do have a fan cast for Max Rebo. You okay. ready? Keanu Reeves. Let's hear it. Yeah. Oh um, my word. <laughs> I'd approve of it. You know, maybe Max Rebo could have a hallway scene where he's playing his piano and deflecting everything, you know? So <laughs> that that's right. Well, so so oh, we yeah. fan cast so we fan casted Max Rebo now. Um Huni, let's go back to the to the merchandise. You didn't get to talk about the merchandise oh, that you have oh, that you yes, have please. that you want. Um take take it away. You're you're making these pitches, I guess. Or, you know, doing the designs, let's get these things into production. But but what do you have for us? So base, okay, base. Just for me walking around for like everyday clothes, going to meetings and talking to people. I want a Max Rebo shirt in the style of the psychedelic posters of like the 60s and the 70s. You know, think like the Jimi Hendrix experience. Like I want that. Oh. So on that note, back in the day, I attended college and I was given an assignment. The assignment was to make an interior and exterior of a space. It's very open-ended. Mm-hmm. You could make your apartment, your home, your car. And I went on to fully fleshing out the YT-1760 freighter that my D&D group flew around in. I was the GM. I okay. drew the characters. I drew the ship. I made the ship, designed the ship, did all the things, and made all these NPCs that these murder hobos that I, you know, call my friends mm-hmm. destroyed. So I just had to constantly have a roving, you know, uh, my, my, my typing wasn't fast enough for how fast these poor fellows got, you know, murked. But I had a POV NPC that I played as to like help out and do whatever. His name was Styx. Styx was a music fan and none of them really got the references. They were more there for the D and D. One of my buddies is a, you know, he's, he's a fan of Star Wars, but he's not like, you know, all the way out there. So he understood the Max Rebo references that I was throwing out and just kind of giggled along. But I always had sticks wearing um, Max Rebo hoodie. And each one of these characters had a room inside the ship that they got to decorate. Mm-hmm. And for Sticks's room, I had that poster. I had the, you know, the Max Rebo psychedelic poster up in the background um and i had him sitting there like loading his uh his slug thrower because he was a sniper for the group and um yeah he was always rocking that sweatshirt so i want a shirt i want a sweatshirt i want a poster i want so much just max rebo (laughs) content right um but yeah and i even had gizka inside the ship that my players were constantly trying to deal with uh, oh nice point where one of them got very very bloodthirsty and didn't understand how they kept coming back. And again, like I said, nobody was on tier. They didn't understand the reference with the Gizka that the whole thing is they just continuously keep coming back. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, he really wanted to extinct those Gizka after a while. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, I want that. Uh, I'd also love, this might be too much. This might be too much. I can't. I can't wear this on my day to day, but I want it. You know, the ears that they have at, you know, Disney parks, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. circles. Yeah. I, I want two elephant ears, two blue elephant ears and a trunk, kind of like the one that you see in Zootopia. I have a little <laughs> brother, six years old, watches so many movies. So proud. And we watched Zootopia. And for the first time, whenever I saw that instantly, that's what I thought of. <laughs> I really want the ears. I want the trunk. I want the whole thing. And I don't know, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm terrifying for having these thoughts, but yeah, I think that'd be great. That'd be a good time. Maybe that's something that you could wear to, you know, his next uh, debut concert, you know? Like, yeah. I think that'll be perfect. Just ears flopping all over the place. And maybe you wear some like designer Ray-Bans to mimic his big, beautiful eyes. I don't know. I feel like there's so much you can do with old Maxie and, uh, yeah, that's not even scratching the surface, I feel. I feel like there's greater minds than mine. Yeah, that could just go off. Yeah. But yeah. Like, you know how there are shoulder porgs and uh, different things like at Galaxy oh. Edge? Shoulder Max Rebo. Like This is true. That, that yeah. would be really cool. Um, yeah. yeah. You know what, Disney? Listen up. Yeah. <laughs> Max Rebo, Bluetooth speaker. With the, oh. the little the little uh 
his little piano there. I okay, I'm gonna get low broad, but yeah, his little piano there, just plugging away. Just have him have articulated little blue fingers. You know, give him two legs, give him four. I don't care. I'm I'm rocking that while I'm showering. I'm gonna put that Bluetooth speaker in every room of the house, and I'm blasting it. I'm <laughs> I'm blasting Jedi rocks. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I love that. I love that. Um, yeah, I mean, you definitely need at least all of the merchandise like you would get, like if you go to a concert, right? And they have the t-shirts and the, the sweatshirts yeah. and the, you know, the concert posters and stuff. You definitely need all of that. Um, when you were, uh, when you were going through your list there, Huni, I had the really great idea. Um, if you have like, like a tie dye shirt, like the Grateful Dead shirts that have the little mm-hmm. teddy bears, but instead oh, of yeah. the teddy bears, they're little Max Rebos. Uh, I think that that would be, <laughs> that would be super cool. Um, I, I yeah. do, ha- I, I do have um, the the Max Rebo, the the Kenner figures, the the OG ones, and I have a Max Rebo nice. uh, tiki mug uh, that just came out last year. One of those uh, geeky oh, tiki's. They yes. did a Max Rebo one, um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, I th- I think definitely what what the world needs, and this this could exist. Maybe I need to need to do a little research and find out if it does to secure one. But I just I just want like a plush Max Rebo. You could set him on the couch. He could be like yeah. a little like throw pillow. He could sit there and watch TV oh, with yeah. you. Um, I, that's, that's all what I want in my life, really. Um, if I think about it. Yeah. I need that security of 12 max rebels looking at the people that have their, <laughs> their highlights on behind me. <laughs> that's <laughs> their, ex- yeah. 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 Blinding me, but they're just looking at, you know, a whole squad of max rebos with their, you know, pupilless eyes staring down at just, them as they you know, <laughs> blind me and the little maxes. Max rebo that's nightlight. What, what about that? Yeah. Oh yeah. That'll that'll be good. Like one of those little hanger things with like the suction cup hands that you put yeah. on your car. Yeah, that would be that would be really. Yeah, cool. I like I like Max that Rebo version. shower head. I like that for sure. The the water comes out of his eyes because he's crying from the beautiful music <laughs> that he makes. Basically, <laughs> we can pitch anything and we can sell it. So yeah, we can, we yeah. we need all sorts. We need to go back to Phantom Menace days uh, and get Max Rebo everything oh, yeah. out there. Basically, yeah, is People what don't we decided. Realize- the Phantom Menace took over everything. Uh, I think, like, mm-hmm. future archaeologists, like, if they exist on, like, uh, in the future, if they're not all dead, <laughs> you know, because of climate change, like, it'll be like, yeah. what, did they worship the Phantom Menace? There's, like, it's on every food <laughs> item and so many toys and everything. And it'll be like, <laughs> yes, right. we, we did. That's so. right. I hope they land at, I think it's Joe Staten's house that has uh, Rancho Obi-Wan. I hope they mm-hmm. land there and just assume that that was our mecca. That, I hope that, that yeah. they're digging through the sands of what used to be and they find the lickable tongue Jar Jar. And they're just like, what What? What were humans? What? Yeah. Was this a what human? I don't know. Yeah. I think they were a mistake. You know? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. This all makes a lot more sense now. But yeah. so, so we came up with some awesome merchandise. But in order to sell the Max Rebo merchandise... What we need to do is we need to put on our, you know, our our film producer hats now and take a step back. So Max Rebo uh, was in The Return of the Jedi, obviously. Uh, we had Max Rebo banned posters in The Clone Wars and in Rebels. Uh, but where else should Max Rebo have been? Huni, do you have like a dream like where... Max Rebo would have shown up in another Star Wars movie or TV show or uh, book or something like that. Where would Max Rebo have really shined and, you know, really raised the the volume on that Star Wars uh, movie or what have you to 11? Avatar 2. Avatar 2? Okay. Avatar 2. Avatar 2 through 6, whatever he's working on right now. Whenever it Avatar comes Avatar 2. Yeah. Whenever that thing comes out, I want I want Max Rebo, no explanation, on one of those <laughs> bird creatures, those bird dragons, with yeah. a spear, two arms or four. I don't care. I just want our boy in there. If he has two, I don't think he'll be stable enough. Honestly, he'll mm, just be hanging mm-hmm. on with the one hand and flailing around with a spear. I I just want to see Max on a dragon. I think we're just giving me this. This whole podcast is just giving me a bunch of assignments to draw now. <laughs> I have uh, Max Rebo Jedi. I have Max Rebo and Avatar. Um, that tie dye shirt is a great idea. I really love the visual of that. But yeah, Max Rebo in Avatar too. I just want to be, you know, 
sneak onto the set with this little puppet and just like, yeah, this fits, <laughs> right? And you're like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's all going to be CGI anyway. Just run in there. I'll put That's on right. a green suit. I'll do the whole thing, and I'll just flop around with the, the hands or the legs or whatever. Yeah, that'll be great. Yeah, there you go. Just uh, tap James Cameron on the shoulder and be like, "What's that over there?" Sneak in your uh, your Max yeah. Rebo puppet. Uh, I like Excuse that. He'd be in there. he'd be in three D, flying right out of the screen at oh, you. Oh yeah, I love yeah, it. yeah, yeah. We could do uh, the Joe Yauza where he you know attacks the camera. <laughs> we could go from the POV of like a uh, uh, space soldier trying to blare rounds down on our little blue man, and he just spears the camera or something and gives out you know a little, little Barry White toot toot or something. I I don't know. Yeah, for sure. Great. No, I love it. Uh, Cassio, what about you? Any uh, any Star Wars uh, film or or otherwise? We can we can go beyond the borders of Star Wars here, but where should Max Rebo pop up? Everywhere. Um, everywhere. Okay. Yeah. Everywhere, all the time, always. Um, but I don't know. I think like I would love to see him like in something animated. Like, what if it was for kids? You know, like when mm-hmm. I when I babysit my nephews like i'm like oh i wonder if there was like an animated you know like star wars show like the little mini things you know like because they there's like mickey cartoons and i mean paw patrol you know <laughs> and <laughs> many other cartoons and i was like oh i wonder if like they, i think they, i think there's room for you know like a new uh, kind of contemporary like Star Wars uh, cartoon for kids and I mm-hmm. think Max Rebo could be a, a fun character if not the lead you know so yeah yeah definitely something something kind of lighthearted. Um, yeah I could definitely like focus on the band and uh, go around with like their travels and things and um, you know stuff like that that would be cool uh, my proposal is that you uh, edit Darth Vader out of Rogue One and it's just uh, Max Rebo oh that God. door opens and yes. and Max just goes to town uh, <laughs> what you know color? everyone ev- everyone loves the hallway scene so just have it be Max Rebo oh, uh, man. Just, this is amazing. just going to town what color <laughs> uh, Max Rebo is definitely a Sith probably so definitely you gotta you gotta stick with the red oh. no nah, I don't know I'm just, I'm just color coordinated <laughs> Jedi with a lightsaber <laughs> That's so. right. Um, I think, I think when we're talking color and we're talking about Max just breaking into a scene, um, it was huge early 2021. Um, are we all familiar with the Bo Burnham special inside mm-hmm. and all the lights that he was using? Yes. I want Max to have that same type of setup where he just has <laughs> like 20 lights just around him. And they're aiming down the hallway and then just boom, he's just <laughs> pressing down on one key, like Kanye West style, just really bringing everyone's attention in. And I want all the color to just be on Max and then turn to them as he just starts blaring music towards them. I think I think that'll be amazing. Yeah, no, I love this. <laughs> yeah, that would be that would be so great. But yeah, Max could show up in a lot of things. Um uh maybe we'll maybe we'll see him in the Andor series. Maybe we'll see him. Mm-hmm. Um, and Obi Wan, maybe uh, you know, if we swing by Jabba's palace, yes. maybe he's there. Um, somewhere we are going to definitely be in Jabba's palace, and I would just, I would just love it. Um, I'm, I'm not like a huge Easter egg person, but next week the book of Boba Fett comes out, and Boba Fett is going to be in Jabba's palace. I just want to see that red ball jet organ just sitting there, covered in like dust and spider webs. Uh, you know, just just hearkening back to to a simpler time when Max Rebo was there performing. Uh, but Book of Boba Fett coming out uh, the end of December. Um, so if you're listening to this when we're releasing it, that should be uh, next week ish. Um, what are your what are your hopes and dreams for the Book of Boba Fett? Anything you're you're hoping for, or just some you know just some general thoughts about the the new show coming out, Huni? What are what are your expectations for it? I know. I know one of us on the podcast is less of a fan than the other of Boba Fett. But what about you, Hooney? Uh, how do you like Boba Fett? And uh, what do you want to see from him? Brian, you've broken my heart. Oh. You're going down a path I can't follow. Oh, this, no. This is so much pain, but that's so beautiful and such such a perfect little, you know, just to see his little instrument sitting there covered in dust. Yeah. Oh, man. That just made me so sad and so happy and so sad. Um, yeah, I have, 
<laughs> I have my ideas on how he could tie in. Uh, I kind of want him to be integral. Um, I want a segment where we see Boba being hauled off by Tusken Raiders. He's saved, but we also see two sets of footprints in the sand. Uh, maybe four. I don't know. Whatever it is, you know, two limbs, two limbs or four, whatever it is. But we know that it's this tiny blue elephant man. This tiny blue elephant man. I got two ways about it. I want Max to be either, you know, sitting on his own chunk of territory that he presides over, a lord in his own way. Mm-hmm. Maybe he's got, you know, a bar or a club or whatever it is, you know, just a real uh, kingpin of that scene, I guess. He he's running Crimson Dawn at this be... point. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. True. Yeah, true. You'd you never broke expect the, internet the blue right elephant. There. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you're expecting to see a red face whenever you come up those stairs of the Crimson Dawn uh, <laughs> headquarters, the stronghold. And then lo and behold, a little trunk is uh, the first thing you see turning around in a chair, a little cigar in hand. Yeah, that's perfect. I love that as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'd, I'd want to see that. Or um, I'd love to see him kind of as an artist that's like struggling. He's past his prime. He's playing small pubs. For, you know, the up and coming mob bosses, you know, these people, they rise and fall after the uh, power vacuum that Jabba left. Um, I want to see a scene where Boba goes to him, you know, kind of like a godfather type of situation. I'm making <laughs> a lot of references here. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> oh, that's but okay. I really want <laughs> I really want a scene where Max is integral. Boba knows that Max is going to be playing this small club at this big uh this big mob boss's uh, behest, and he contacts this little little man, and he says, "I'm going to be disarmed. I know that they're going to take my weapons. Uh, I need you to hide this for me." And he hands him like a little blaster. I'd love to see a scene where he's waddling around after you know, you know, talking talking shop with all these these gangsters, and goes to the bathroom and has some tape and puts a little blaster behind the toilet or something. (laughs) And then, uh, yeah, he comes in clutch for Boba at one point. Or maybe, you know, um, Boba feigns that he's a huge fan, like all of us. I mean, none of us are feigning. None of us are fake fans for Max. But I want a scene where we could could do that, or we could do Max, you know, signing shirts for fans, handing (laughs) them out, Disney, merch, merch Disney. Yeah. (laughs) He signs a shirt for Boba. And whenever Boba unfolds the shirt, he finds a grubby old slug thrower with the serial number scratched off. Mm-hmm. There you go. Mm-hmm. And then he's off to the races to take on this this other boss. Or maybe we get a mixture of that with like the Red Wedding and Desperado, where Max says he'll help Boba, but he needs the money and has to betray him. Oh and, no! Oh. You know, his contact offers a load of credits for this rival gang, and Max has converted his piano board into you know. A blaster cannon and oh, you know, wow. he says his he says his sorries to to boba but then he just has to you know unload in his direction he's not releasing music he's burning down walls <laughs> i don't know i, I think that there's, there's a type of tragedy in that it's a little bit beautiful yeah um, yeah yeah <laughs> well i can what never about... what can i what can I say after that? <laughs> what can you add to that? Um, well, you can't add anything in terms of Max Rebo because that's all the bases. Max Rebo should be doing all of that stuff. But what about Book of yeah. Boba Fett, Cassia? Um, you are self-proclaimed not a Boba Fett fan, which is perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, but maybe but I what need are? To repent. But, I don't know. Yeah, maybe you need to repent. But maybe, <laughs> maybe if you were writing the Book of Boba Fett and you wanted Boba Fett to be a character that you could get behind. What would that show look like? I guess I would just want to see some depth and some growth and not just like uh, kind of go from I want some depth, you know, and like Boba Fett has had an interesting journey, but it's interesting because like he's always kind of he was a he was a kid in the prequel trilogy kind of aligned with, like, you know, the villains. And then he was kind of an anti-hero, maybe a villain. I, I saw him more as a villain, but, uh, I mean, in the EU, he became more of a, an anti-hero, kind of basically just a gruff kind of hero, kind of maybe mm-hmm. like the, the Draco Malfoy, you know, of the Star Wars galaxy. Like, he was sure, bad, yeah. but kind of reformed, I guess. 
and uh, I don't know, like, I just want to see, like, when I was watching the second season of The Mandalorian, it just, it seemed like in the first episode, I was like, okay, we got an answer that Boba Fett did survive, but it doesn't seem like he's, like, rushing after uh, Mando to, to get his armor back from, from mm-hmm. Din. It seemed like he was kind of accepting that that chapter of his life had concluded, and he had a mm-hmm. new life. Uh, he mm-hmm. survived on on Tatooine, and I was like, okay, that was a good ending for Boba Fett. But then it's like, jump forward to uh, when he shows up again, and it's kind of just like, uh, in my mind, it was kind of a bit of a whiplash. It's like Boba Fett's here just to be awesome, and he's helping the he's helping out Din, kind of like no questions asked and it seemed like he was kind of overly heroic so i hope that the book of boba fett uh just delves into the characters and their and their journey so so that season two makes a bit more sense for me and i will repent and i'm sorry if i'm like just being like but i don't like boba fett so neither should you so i apologize like i guess it was just kind of a a fun like shtick to to go with but (laughs) Boba Fett's not my favorite, but I'm willing to be convinced otherwise. Um, I feel like to talk seriously <laughs> about yeah. redeeming Boba to give him more depth, I think it would be a really huge missed opportunity. They reference Jester Muriel and his father uh, with the chain code uh, in Mandalorian, but I feel like it would be a really great opportunity if they did have like a flashback episode to talk about Jaster Muriel and his relationship with Django and then the teachings that he took from Jasper uh, or Jaster, Jasper, um, and passed on to Boba. I feel like there's a, a lot of um, flavor that we could have there. And I don't know, I'm all for, and I feel like, like open seasons, like Clone Wars, I feel like season three of Mandalorian, maybe we'll get hints of it in the book of Boba Fett. I feel like we're going to see a Mandalorian civil war and I'm all the way here for it. Maybe that'll be the perfect way to segue into talking about, you know, the differences between the different clans would be having that flashback episode to um, the differences that Jaster had with uh, a couple of his, his men there. I'm forgetting the name of his antagonist in the book, but Death Watch is addressed in that as well. And then Jaster being one of the true Mandalorians. Um, Yeah. I feel like that could give a lot of depth and then you could kind of carry over how uh, Django was as a father to Boba. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I really hope that they um, are able to explore, um, you know, him on a more personal level, um, to explore Fennec Shan on kind of a personal level. Um, oh, yeah. And, and maybe explore, you know, if, if they'd had a relationship like prior to, because we know now through the Bad Batch that she's been around. So, yeah, I'm just, I'm just looking forward to it. I think that it's, I think at the very the very minimum it's going to be a fun watch and i really hope that they can you know breathe some really like interesting stuff into these characters and i've always been kind of one of those people that would have been interested in seeing like a crime syndicate kind of thing going on so i think that this is going to be you know kind of along those lines so uh i'm really looking forward to it and one last shout out for max rebo we're going to see him in the book of boba fett because boba fett and fennec oh, yeah. and are going to get married and who's going to play their wedding? It's going to be Max Rebo. <laughs> so there you go. Oh, yeah. So, so on that note, on, on the wedding of the century, Max Rebo wailing away. I uh, want to thank Hooney for joining us for this very awesome behind course, the music episode. Um, this was a ton of fun. It's been a long time in the making. We've been talking about it for a while. And uh, the time was finally right. The world was ready for the Max Rebo special. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Why don't you tell everyone listening out there uh, where they can find you online and, you know, check out your art and, you know, what all you have going on right now. Um, yeah, so I'm an artist. Uh, I do a lot of drawing. I stay up till three in the morning uh, working on just basic inks and tiny details of things because I was so obsessed with those background details as a kid. And that's continued to carry over uh, to speak on the clay figures i worked on those until the sun came up and then played with them probably whenever i woke up uh, i built these armies so i have this this already built in um work ethic that is um, probably not the best but if you want to see the results of that work and those sleepless nights and 
the coffee fueled ink work and coloring, you can go to who need D on uh, Instagram. A lot of people have taken to calling me haunted or haunted. I'm used to this. Uh, I've become accustomed to it. Um, and yeah, it is Hooney D for David, but it is what it is. And yeah, just come hang out, come check out my stuff, give my page a scroll and you'll definitely see some Max Rebo stuff. And who knows, uh, there might be a big block of uh, Max Rebo pieces after this pod. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we could we could get uh, the two, the original and the special editions lo-fi, you Ooh. know, and and oh, yes. a max that'd be amazing. Uh, Rebo uh, lo-fi piece from you. I think your head might explode, you know, like oh yeah, getting yeah, all 100%. the Easter eggs you want, but. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Uh, a lo-fi of yeah. uh, Jedi Jedi rocks. That's going to have to be in the works for yeah. us uh, yeah. somewhere. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, in closing thoughts, Max Rebo is awesome. Uh, thank you, Huni, for joining us. Thank you, everyone out there, for listening to us. Uh, we hope you love Max Rebo as much as we do. Um, and, you know, take care, and may the Force be with you. <laughs>